Welcome to Speak of the Devil. My name is Reverend Campbell, and I've got a fantastic show for you this week. Today, I'm going to be joined by Warlock Gregory T. Cross, and we're going to be talking about his newest release, The Seder of New Orleans. But before we get to that, let me give a quick shout out to uh, the brand new patrons. I really appreciate you guys. Uh, Robert and Antoine, uh, thank you so much for your support. And brand new admirator patron, of course. Um, and of course, all of these are brought to you by the Benefactory of Patrons, Ara and DA. You guys kick some ass. <laughs> thank you so much for your support. Let me give a quick shout out to uh, the gentlemen in the chat room, Adam and Gary. I appreciate you guys. I know it's a, a hassle moving to this new streaming uh, provider and I'm not happy about it myself but it's something that we have to deal with in this moment so you know you do what you got to do uh, but again I've already mentioned at the top here we're going to be talking with uh, Warlock Grigori so my friend how are you doing? Hi everyone I'm doing very well I just got a raise. Oh <laughs> congratulations that's awesome. That's going to that's going to color the entire conversation. <laughs> Cheater. Wait, what kind of a raise? Because I know the book that we're talking about. I don't know if I, I mean who says it can't be both. Hey, I'm game. I dig it. <laughs> I appreciate it. That's great. Um I I do have to say at the top, and I've already told you before we got on in, in you know sort of pre-show conversation. You are a little too chill for my comfort level. Like I feel <laughs> like you're li you're like channeling the dude a little bit. <laughs> so I it, may it, end. It, it, I may mimic you in some way. It's not because I'm trying to. It's just like you're bringing me down to the chill level, man. <laughs> it's funny, down. actually. The, it's funny, actually. The uh, the the whenever I, I I have the mannerisms of the dude, but I always connect more with Walter somehow. No, oh, really. <laughs> <laughs> That's scary. <laughs> <laughs> it's the quiet ones you got to worry about, but uh, Walter ain't That's quiet. My life. Oh my goodness. Um, all right, well, we got a lot of ground to cover. I mean, you got this brand new book that you just released. Well, not just released. You recently released. Um, you and I have never spoken on camera before. And so I kind of want to get a little bit of the behind the scenes of who you are. What makes you tick type stuff if you're comfortable with it. So can you give me a little rundown? Give everyone else in the audience a little rundown. Um, you know, tell us a little bit about yourself. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Uh, born in Northern California, now in Southern California. Went to UC Berkeley, graduated from UC Berkeley. I'm all, I'm, I have a green philosophy. I've been, um, I've been creating music on and off for uh, well over half my life at this point. Uh, sometimes that went somewhere, sometimes it did not. Um, what kind of music? And, uh, it was, hmm. <laughs> it was, that's so hard to, uh, it, it's basically a kind of heavy metal, but, but, uh, but when I say heavy metal, when people, uh, uh, people think of that nowadays as just the heavy riffs and the screaming and we, uh, um, the former guitarist for that band did not, uh, scream very much, if at all. Maybe in the maybe in the very initial stages, but um, it was very melodic, progressive metal, if you want to call it that. It, it was it was weirdly it was influenced a lot by new metal at the time, right. but but um, but we had none of the rapping that's usually in there. Uh, it it was a really really good time while it lasted, and now I'm. I'm doing my best to get out uh, um, a kind of like solo EP or something like that later this year. Oh, wow. Well, yeah, that's pretty cool. A, <laughs> so what instrument do you play? Um, <laughs> I started out on the cello, 
was classically trained for several years at school. Um, once I discovered heavier music, I, I moved kind of naturally to the bass guitar and then discovered uh, that. And that's when I had this band because I was playing bass for them. And um, once I once I realized that, oh, when I'm listening to music, the, the, the thing I'm paying attention to is the guitar. So there's that. Mm. I chose, I, so I chose to migrate over the, over to the guitar, and now I've been playing that for, I don't know, um, probably a good 10 plus years. Wow. So is this all going to be guitar-centric EP music, or is it going to be like, are you doing any vocal work, or are you getting other people to join yeah. you for it? Uh, the, mm, it's... The uh, uh, accompaniment will probably be sparse at mm. best. It, it's most, I would imagine, with the way things are going, it'll probably be uh, me on the guitar and vocals, and then like I'll pepper in some um, uh, electronics a la Nine Inch Nails or Radiohead to give it a, a little bit more character and, you know, percussion because it's not a piano and, not, and less of a percussive instrument and I'm not one of those guitarists who can start strumming and, and also like smack it on the body and whatnot. Right. Um, yeah, it, it's it's a bit of an undertaking, but uh, but the uh, going to the beach and um, composing at the same time helps a lot. Cool. You got to let me know when that stuff's coming out. I'd love to hear what you got. I will. Cool. Um, okay, so I'm sorry. I did totally interrupt your stream here. Um, can you tell me a little bit about your 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 background as far as, do you have like a religious background? Because clearly you're a Satanist, and so I'm always interested in, in discovering how other people have came upon the religion. No, you'll never believe this one. Um, the, the real, real crash course before Satanism <clears throat> is um I, uh, I i don't know the exact years but um but the the general estimation i usually give people is that i was <laughs> nominally at at best i would say a christian from ages four to 18. <laughs> um oddly which specific is, <laughs> which is funny because um People usually uh, tend to say that, uh, like, like reading the Bible made them an atheist. But, but, um, but I, I took a Bible as literature class in um, while I was in high school, and um, it wasn't that that got me into atheism. Um, I, I don't remember. Oh, that's right. Uh, for a second, I just I actually forgot completely how I lost my faith. Um, the, <laughs> it was wild back. Um, uh, sometime around eighteen, um, I say four, by the way, because that's the that's the year I um, seem to remember being introduced to a children's Bible. Oh and, yeah, and that that got its hooks in me, and uh, that was only confirmed by the fact that my uh, school at the time was uh, I was learning about religion in there and i was learning about um ancient myths egyptian greek stuff like that oh, yeah. um which is much better uh, <laughs> but uh they were teaching those as mythology hmm. and then when it came to christian stuff it was that that kind of that talk kind of fell away and i'm like yeah. oh so we figured out what was what was going on okay yeah. got it and then thousands of years of human history life. was wrong yeah. but you're right got it <laughs> and, and i accepted that uh, for the time being right. and um and eventually it was it was uh i have no idea why but i started questioning um why i thought jesus had ever existed mm -hmm. and <laughs> somehow that was the breaking point all of a sudden that i was just like Okay, so apparently this probably isn't for me, and that I was looking more thoroughly into the theology and it's like, 
well, the fucking sickness, what the hell are you, uh, what are you expecting here? Um, <laughs> didn't go that well. Um, once that was over, I moved to, and incidentally, I should interrupt myself to say that the, your question about the religious background, hmm? I was raised in a secular household, but um, Wait, I was, what? yeah, that's right. Um, it was my grandmother, actually, who um, introduced me to the children's Bible. Uh, my uh, my mother and my father were both uh, were both secular, and um, uh, my mother's actually got a, um, some Buddhist leanings, although that didn't really enter into the into into the equation right. because it was a, it's a generally understood notion that um, the way <laughs> the way um, the way to really be integrated into this culture is to know Shakespeare well and know the Bible well. And I, I got a good heaping of both of those. And again, you see where that lived. But, yeah. uh, <laughs> but and that was all broken. I was still, I realized from my earlier uh, time, um, at the time, uh, as soon as I broke away from Christianity, I was, I, I was just like, okay, so I'm an atheist. So what now? And then it was, um, I was remembering the my earlier days when I was uh, reading, uh, I think it's Macbeth. Um, the it's the heavy reading scene. for earlier days. <laughs> Macbeth. We, we, we I had a good school. Um, we had uh, the the uh, those scenes with all the all those scenes with the witches mm. in Macbeth. Mm. Um, double, double, toil and trouble, mm. all that good stuff. Um, I, Well, shit. <laughs> I did not see that coming. Uh, the stream was just interrupted. I'm hoping we can get him back. It looks like uh, it's trying to reconnect. Man, just when it was getting good, right? Macbeth, you gotta love it. Hopefully this can reconnect here. Am I still on? Yeah, you're That's back. That's what I thought. There we back. go. There just we a go. bad connection. We're back now. <laughs> of course of course i do have to say this is not a streaming issue this is a skype issue because <laughs> the streaming is quite fine i do not understand why we are having such a bad connection here right now <clears throat> uh okay so we're gonna give it just a second to see if we can get him back hopefully we can <laughs> i mean you never know this stuff you know this is the weird thing like you can reflect back in uh, the history of telebroadcasting, right? And people were all over the world reporting on world events, and you never saw it Some cut out. Happens. It just was, you know. But now, even now with technology, it's cutting out. So I I heard you just for a second, Gregorian, but I do not see you, and uh, it looks like uh, we're still <clears throat> even though I can definitely hear your phone <laughs> vibrating. Are you there? <laughs> Not a pleasant connection issue we got going on. Okay, so let me uh, do a little uh, soft shoe here. Are you back? Maybe not. Okay. While we try to get him back... Let me uh, let me uh, let you guys know that you can always uh, go to Amazon or Barnes and Noble or Lulu and search the Seder of New Orleans to check out his newest uh, book. I am halfway through it. I'm like sixty percent the way through it, and there's some insanely intense moments in it that uh, are pretty goddamn erotic. I was not expecting that erotic fiction at all. But it's there. So for those of you who may not uh, be <laughs> schooled on what it's about, it's uh, it's it's pretty uh, pretty raw. You there? Okay, I'm here. All right, let's see if we can get you back on here. Hey, this is how how it works. Sometimes you know we have issues. Sometimes we don't, and we just 
we have to deal with it. This is what the world gives us, and we, uh, we're going to deal with it. Uh, how's it going, Master Tor? Thanks for joining us in the chat. All right, so um, you were talking about how you're, you grew up in a secular family. Uh, your mother had a little bit of leaning of Buddhism, but it didn't really play heavily into uh, anything. So uh, you want to pick up where you left Clearly. off? Clearly. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, <laughs> I am... Good God, I'm a long-winded bastard, aren't I? Um, all right, so we went from I I went I went I made a connection because I was still enjoying uh, um, the Christian ethos, right? Uh, without Christ, bro. Mm. Uh, They're all enjoy- without Christ. To be fair, I mean. He died a long time ago, if he existed in the first place. So, <laughs> oh, the, the ever the ever ending question. Um, okay, so I <laughs> as you're blowing as up over there. I, <laughs> I can hear every vibration of your phone, dude. It's like the lo- loudest phone vibration ever. It's the yeah I, and yeah the it was the current events have been. Had an interesting, an interesting effect on my, on my phone at work today. It was, it, and I was doing uh, everything I could to just yell at it, like, shut up. <laughs> Trying to uh, celebrate. <laughs> the, um, we got, um, as I left Christianity, I said to myself, well, my views on things can't be that original. I ha- it, it ha- it's all too likely. That I uh, um, that I can feel uh, that I, I can feel connected to some system, mm. and um, and I am <laughs> perhaps unlike some Satanists. I am I've always been kind of fascinated by religion rather than like opposed to it. Mm-hmm. Um, even this, even despite being like totally enamored for several years by uh, of. The, uh, the new atheists like Dawkins and Hitchens, but not. Um, in any case, I went to Wicca first mm-hmm. because I still needed the I still needed the Christian ethos, but they I, I couldn't have any of the metaphysics. But I wanted to, I also wanted witchy stuff, so I, I let that uh, I, I let that sink in for a while, and um, eventually I realized, and by eventually I mean like a year later, that <laughs> I wasn't quite. Um, how should I say it? I, I wasn't uh, I wasn't taking it seriously enough, so I went back to atheism, and then, not long after that, I went back to Wicca <laughs> because I was, I was like, okay, I'm gonna give this a second, second shot, and I've got uh, I've, I I want to see what I can do with all these sabbats and esbats, and I like to celebrate things, and yeah, let's see how that goes, and that did not last very long at all. Mm-hmm. And eventually, and here's the part you'll never believe, I saw a movie called Paranormal Activity. I believe you saw that movie. <laughs> um, a lot of people saw that movie. I, yes. I, um, I, I, I went him blind. Um, and and for, for those of you who don't know, that movie is uh, it, it takes place in San Diego. It makes it that makes that part of it very clear mm-hmm. from the get go. Um, and I was at the time in San Diego, so um, I was I was like, "Wait, is it like what's going on here?" Like <laughs> I had no idea like uh, what, what I was about to get into. Um, I'm like, is this supposed to be a documentary or like is this, like I thought it was going to be a movie? Like what what the hell is going on? Yeah. And as things go on, I'm like I'm enjoying it and all that, but um, it, uh, I'm there's a lot of um, baphometic imagery, if that's a word. Uh, <laughs> there's a lot of a lot of devilly things yeah. centered around the uh, around the digital the the whole possession thing if that's what we're going to be calling it it's, it's more like a haunting but anyway um 
So this, uh, <laughs> the end of that movie, um, I was, uh, minor tangent, but you'll understand in a second. Um, when I, I think it was Disneyland, when I was, when I was at Disneyland. <laughs> That's a hell of a tangent to jump from paranormal activity to Disneyland. You, you'll understand, you'll understand okay. when, um. Did you ever, um, have, you, have you ever been on um, uh, the, the Honey, I Shrunk the Kids ride? Mm -mm. Uh, I think that's the one that it is, but um, there is a 3D ride. And you, know, like, you have 3D glasses on the whole time, and um, the ray that is supposed to like shrink you, it's like, the, like they're demoing it at first, and like they project in front of you a picture of a kitty. And then... That kitten's face turns into something a little more fierce, but not quite like like leonine. It, it's more, it's more just like like angry house cat type of territory. And then it actually becomes a lion, and it, and like you know it's like right here, like right the hell in front of you. And then and suddenly you get the feeling that it's about to bite your head off. And I'm very very young at the at the time then. Uh, seeing this, and this is the only time I ever saw it, I just realized. Um, I had to close my eyes when that happened. <laughs> I'm like, this is not happening. This is just not <laughs> happening. And, and I say this because that is the same reaction that I had at the end of Paranormal Activity. Oh, yeah. I, I, um, the, the, uh, have you, you have seen it? Oh, yeah. Numbers. Oh, Numbers okay, so the, okay, that um, when when she looks up at the camera at the very end and and smiles, mm -hmm. it, it's like I somehow knew something like that was about to happen. I'm like, nope. <laughs> I'm not giving and, you the satisfaction. And, and then, and the, like in the corner of my eye, I see her, I see that her face transforms and she lunges at you, which I and I've since seen the actual scene, but uh, but I'm like, nope, this isn't happening. <laughs> I. I did not sleep that night, and uh, in order to get me through that night, I um, I actually put on um, an old Bogey and McCall movie called The Have and Have Not, Whoa. and and that oh god that felt it, it felt so good to see to see Bogey and McCall just doing their thing at five a.m. Uh, <laughs> um, Exercise the demons. <laughs> <laughs> And then that somehow turned into my going to the movies again at 11 a.m. the next morning to see Cloudy with the Chance of Meatballs too. But um, all in all, the point is that um, that little scene somehow traumatized me, right. and I and I was I was at a complete loss because I was I was you know I was. An atheist at that point. I didn't. I didn't see like, like there was no reason for me to have been frightened of these things. It's like, right. what, the hell about, what the hell was I frightened about? And then, so I do what I I did what I do in in those situations, and I just started researching the hell out of it. And I'm in the middle. I, I, I'm seeing like. What it is that that uh, uh, um, like the Baphomet refers to, and and all these little bits and pieces, and I come across um, I am not going to say her name, but uh, someone who is very um, a, a, let's say a big name in um, they would prefer not to be called this, I'm sure, but devil worshiper circles, um, and I'm like. I can kind of get into this because it because and because I'm going all like because even though I don't believe in it, it's mm -hmm. like I can see I can see like I can see taking the whole devil thing as a metaphor for like the earth and whatnot, and basically having the same similar kind of religious religious experiences, well. and eventually. <laughs> Eventually, um, I happened upon, uh, I, I don't even know how I ended up searching all of this, but um, eventually I ended up at the 
at a, a website you might know well as uh, you know churchofsatan.com uh, I'm was this the old one where it, with like uh, it, it opened with the dust tear drama uh, ritual yeah, 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 that's, yeah, right. yeah. That was that's the one that was the one um, and I'm seeing like it, it was so much text but um, but the, <laughs> I was I'm seeing I, I'm seeing like this list of uh, like you know, the um, statements, the rules, mm -hmm. the uh, sins, all that stuff. I'm, I'm seeing all this in, and I'm going like, you know, it's funny. These people actually say explicitly that they're taking the whole Satan thing as a metaphor. Have I been doing this wrong the whole time? <laughs> <laughs> And then it then I moved to um, I saw a an interview between Megas Gilmore and George Stromboopoulos on a, a program called The Hour apparently, and um, that opened up a whole new world. And uh, suddenly I, I was I think it was not long after that that I. Um, I picked up a copy of the Satanic Bible on eBay, and, oh. and then it was like, it was like this small package, and, and I'm like, I'm like, this is it. This is this is the moment that like I'm like, what is what the hell is going to be inside here? And then I pull it out, and it's this tiny little like paperback. I'm like, huh? And, and I'm like, no this, demons. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. Huh. Yeah, see, like I, I, I'm like I'm not even sure what to expect. At this point. I just flip open the book and I'm like I'm immediately in like the middle of the Anakian keys, and I'm like, okay, <laughs> and, okay, let's 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 see what else we've got here. Uh, this is man, this is this is like half the book here. Uh, yeah, <laughs> and eventually, eventually, it, um, and then it was. Over the course of the next uh, four or so months, this was in the yeah, this is uh, later in 2010. Um, yeah, 2010. I I take four months. I I read the book um, at least once each of those months. <laughs> oh wow! In it because because I'm going like because each time. I'm, the first time it was like, holy shit, this mm -hmm. is like, like the, the um, it, it was, it was both a mirror type of thing that the, the people uh, that other sickness usually talk about, but it was also, um, some of my perspectives were actually being challenged. Nice. Like I, I had not completely rid myself of um, the, the, the metaphysics of like the the Christ and the wickedness and all that mm -hmm. bullshit. Uh, and especially in, um, I think it's in the God you save, maybe yourself. The, uh, I, I was, I was still kind of spiritually minded at that point, and and the whole thing's like, it's like the, I'm summarizing here, but the um, like the whole bit about like, you know, suddenly the man thinks about the the his spiritual side and realizes it's, it's just the carnal. And it always has been. I'm mm -hmm. like, I can't argue against this. <laughs> <laughs> and, it, and it was, that was freeing at the time. And then I kept coming back. To, I, I kept coming back to certain passages as I read it, as I read it through over and over. But yeah. eventually, eventually it became, is he really saying what I think he's saying? <laughs> <laughs> and, Eventually, of course, I figured it, I figured out that yes, I am not in fact misreading it, and this was a book that was meant just for me. And <laughs> and by New Year's Eve, twenty eleven, by that the going over to twenty eleven, mm -hmm. that's when that's when I started calling myself a Satanist on uh, just internally. Yeah. And then I spent the next year <laughs> um, figuring out if. Um, if there was, in fact, an organization that uh, lived up to what this book was teaching, and um, 
I went through so many detractors claims. God, that was a long time. <laughs> but but it, it was so many, like, so many times these, these people just, like, they don't understand what it is they're saying. And it was, the, like, the whole, especially with, like, the, it, it was it was especially fun coming across the, the dichotomy of Peter Gilmore is a parrot of Anton LaVey, and Peter Gilmore is nothing like Anton LaVey. Yeah. So it's like, you can only have one of these. You do realize that, right? <laughs> either, either way, either way, in, I want to say you're wrong either way, but, um, yeah. but, that, but, it's, but that's because of my, um, I, I am gained a better understanding of our maestro since then. Mm. But um, yeah, obviously, I, I I came to a conclusion by the end of that year because I started because uh, I sent in my money on the <laughs> I sent in my membership fee when it was still two hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. um, when um, the the first day of the spring semester in um, when I was attending community college, uh, that was, was January twenty third, twenty twelve. Oh, nice. I remember that because, because one, two, three. Yeah. And, and, and not long thereafter, received my first card, and I did the whole baptism thing, and now I'm just enjoying the ride. <laughs> nice. There's a couple things buried in that that I, I really appreciate, and, and I'm hoping other people can appreciate it too, so allow me to uh, uh, retort here. Um, I love the idea that you kept going back to uh, Wicca, like you, you were a staunch um, secularist and atheist. You rationally thought that this is kind of all bullshit, and yet you kept going back. And I can't help but think that our our human desire for ritual is a big factor in that going back to old habits. You're like you don't really believe in the religion, but you really enjoy the ritualistic aspects of it. And maybe you just enjoy the aesthetics of it. Maybe you just enjoy the, you know, if, if there's nonsensical phrases that are muttered during incantations or rituals, that maybe that's what you love about it. But that's what I really desperately love so much about Satanism is that it does connect that and it not, not just connects, but, full-fledged hands in the air accepts look we're human beings we need ritual this is part of what makes us human our experience as human beings so let's not get rid of it let's not throw it out whole cloth like every atheist will ever let's just meet it on our own terms let's use it for our own ends rather than succumbing to some oh, you know nonsensical idea that it's some sky mother or daddy telling us what we need to do and that's why we need to do it or or us so desperately wanting to fuck that girl down the street that we're gonna do everything <laughs> we can you know like i mean ultimately that's really what it comes down to right it's either celebrating the seasons desiring some man or woman to stick it in your dick or you know whatever and that, that'd be actually weird sticking it in your dick <laughs> oh i can see and then he, <laughs> we lose his connection again. Um, I'm going to try to get him back here as I'm, I'm prattling on. Um, but I, that's, that's the part that's so in, incredibly important. Like I went through a very similar situation when I was first coming into Satanism in that you're raised in the way that you're raised. In his case, he was raised in a secular household, but his grandmother brought him up with uh, Christianity, introduced him to Christian religion with the child bible early on and he, he believed it all it's hard if you grew up with an idea it's hard to shake that idea later in life it even if that idea is is self-defeating um destroys any potential future you have and i'm not necessarily saying that all about you know christianity but certainly people are brought up in abusive environments or or just abjectly negative environments and and that can wear on them that leaves a stain on them moving forward and it takes a special type of person to be able to break out of that pattern of behavior um and so you know just understanding that you may have been brought up in a specific way and it may take you a while to get over that hurdle but that's not to say that you can't get over it you can't move beyond it and and that's 
part again of what I love so much about Satanism is it, it instead of saying, you know what, everything that you knew was bad, let's just embrace a absolute emptiness, you know, as you are going to inevitably encounter in some sort of atheistic, secular, de facto view of the world, um, then, uh, you know, given that position, um, you're left still without your humanity. If you then explore ritual or you explore different expressions of your humanity uh, within those confines, you can find something a little deeper, a little truer, a little more honest. And even if that doesn't lead you down the road of, uh, you know, if you're just not Satanist, that's fine too. I don't personally give a fuck. Um, it is important to at least experiment, to try to experiment experience different avenues and, and understand that you know just simply because you were taught it does not mean it's true simply because you were learned uh, that you in fact learned that growing up and that it, you know you reflect on your own life as some sort of truth of experience that doesn't make it abject truth it's all through perspective lens and so i think it is important to not only challenge your own way of, of thinking and behaving but also experimenting with things that maybe you at one time thought were nonsensical and stupid or uh gregory thank you for coming back in your particular um position taking a few steps you know sort of like uh, back and forth to to discover where in fact you identify in life i respect that much more than someone who just never had the exposure wiped their hands clean and walked into something saying, this is what I believe. No, I, th I think you kind of need experience. You need a little tarnish on your veneer that, that tells you that you've lived, you've experienced, you know? That was actually the uh, uh, one, uh, those two things, the two things that I was, uh, I was really felt confirming for me as I was reading the Satanic Bible. The, um, there was a lot of, there was a lot of doubt is the is like this the big tool that leads that leads to real like knowledge it's not going to be like you're just gonna as you just said like you're just gonna walk in all confident and suddenly have all the answers it's, it's i'm going to come to my conclusions very slowly and with a lot of consideration yeah. taken into consideration and then there was a, and, and and the um there was a bit about um He admits, LeVay admits the, the, about the, uh, again, as you were saying, the, uh, the need, the human need for ritual. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I was reading that, in the, that whole passage, I'm like, cool. So this is, ex so I, the, the thing that I've been actually looking for is right here. And yeah. it, it, you're, you're, you actually, you there is something down, there's something written down that is literally catering to my own need to, to say that, that like, okay, so the, the, I'm, I'm being all like rational and skeptical, but at the, at the same time, isn't this kind of fun? <laughs> <laughs> and oddly enough, that led to, um, when I was, uh, um, when I was attending UC <laughs> Berkeley, I was, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was, um, the single extracurricular activity I had was being part of the Berkeley Atheist and Skeptic Society. And um, I, for all, for, for all I know, and as far as I can tell, it is now defunct because uh, it, it seems to be that uh, all, the, all the people who were interested in keeping it going have graduated. <laughs> Hmm. Um, and it doesn't seem to be around anymore. But well, uh, during the time I was there, I um, I wasn't even I, I wasn't even an active member yet. But I was. But I I saw an opportunity because Halloween was coming up. I'm like, you know, guys, what would be fun? <laughs> and suddenly I find myself giving a whole presentation on Satanism and 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 the the main takeaway since they since these were not like uh, uh, people who were immediately like like uh, giving me pushback just because just because it was a religion um 
<laughs> especially because the, the way I introduced myself often was I am probably the sole religious member of this body. <laughs> and and it, the whole, the whole, uh, the, the, their takeaway I gathered was more or less that they should go out to the movies more. They should go out and, Go out to experience the theater more. Mm-hmm. Like they, they should be able to uh, be able to under, uh, um, better understand what it means to immerse themselves in. Um, uh, I wanted to, I want to say creative avenues or something like that, which is absolutely true. But um, but uh, you should immerse them. Be able to immerse themselves in uh, a kind of mythology that. They, that they really connect to and 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 explore what potential they have and could be as a result of making themselves feel better by doing it. Right. Yeah, I think there's. I don't make that big of a difference personally, and I don't. I don't want to harp on this too long because we, you know sure. we're like forty minutes in. We haven't talked about your book yet, but. <laughs> I don't make that big of a distinction personally between hardcore Christians and hardcore atheists because they're both railing about two sides of the exact same coin. Um, in my personal experience, anyway, it's always like, there's no Christian God. Stop believing in Christian God. And the other says like, there's a Christian God. You must believe in a Christian God. And the rest of us are looking around like, why are you guys screaming? Like, can we just, can we go get some ice cream or something? Why are you, why are you arguing so much? <laughs> I, I'm yeah, I, I, I'm I'm happy to say that the, that the the company I had the uh, at least the upper echelon in that particular group was the more chilled out variety who were nice. who were more more in tune with um, the the um, wonderfully deep voice of Christopher Hitchens and the and the uh, I want uh, not I wouldn't say so much the arguments of Richard Dawkins more, probably more along the lines of Sam Harris at that point. Right. But, um, and then, and then of course, Daniel Dennett came to my school and then I shook his hand and took a picture with him. So there's that, but, <laughs> um, but it was, it was, yeah, it was a wonderful experience and I, and I wouldn't have been able to do that without my newfound church. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's, let's get into your writing because, uh, you've got a, a new book, the Seder of New Orleans that's out now. Uh, before we start talking about it, can you give a little plug? Where can people find this? What's the best place for them to go to learn anything about it? I would say the best place, uh, the best place to purchase, I think, is Lulu because the print version is 25% off at all times. Oh, and, um, but you can also, it's also available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, all the major retailers, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Well, I highly recommend you guys check it out. I've been reading it, as I already mentioned uh, in the show. I'm, I'm over halfway through with it, and there's some uh, there's some rawness to it that I can appreciate. <laughs> I'll, I'll put it like that. So before we dive into this conversation about the book itself, I want to go over a little bit of inspirations. I want to go over a little bit of your history with writing. When did you first discover a, a sort of passion for writing? Um. That is one of the most difficult questions I've ever heard put to me. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I, I have uh, the thing is I've been writing since uh, it was a very young age that I, mm-hmm. that I was that I was writing like the <laughs> the um, I, I want I want to say like the in my self deprecating way I want to say like the worst kind of amateur poetry but I but I also use some of that poetry as like um, uh, um, material for assignments in like middle school and I was consistently handed back these poems with, like what a fascinating ending and like the, the like people were complimenting me this entire time so I don't right. know why I'm being so hard on myself uh, as it's but as it you know as things progressed then it was I was, I was drawn always to music, and my mother was um, tempering that with uh, the Bible and Shakespeare 
and I was being able to understand Shakespeare. I found was not a uh, not a skill that uh, very many people possess. Right. <laughs> and um, as as it as it went on, I, I was understand I. Um, English classes didn't go as well for me as I would have liked, but that's partially because I, I did not find myself interested in high school. It was basically a glorified social experiment for me. But, <laughs> um, but it was probably uh, uh, my interest in philosophy that, that really drew me back to writing in general, honestly. The uh, I stopped caring about school after uh, after I graduated high school for a while, <laughs> and eventually, eventually, actually, it was uh, YouTube atheists <laughs> that had that, uh, watching them had me interested in had me re interested in religion at that point, and suddenly I was I I, I was being really, um, I was gripped by the way, the way religions used words, and especially in like, um, uh, 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 like in in the Bible, for instance, there the um, the uh, like the notion of God's word, the logos. That's it's so it's so simple, and yet its meanings are like an infinitude unto themselves like it's so it's dense and so rich with i want to say color and I'm mm. not, like the, the, the non synesthetes are not going to understand this um i i fell in love with with the way words could dance on my tongue right and it's that eventually took me to back to just philosophy because more so than just the religiosity of all these various uh, uh, various thinkers I was in, I was so interested in the way they were weaving thoughts especially in Nietzsche mm -hmm. um, to to make um, like my mind was on fire at some point. And once I once I got to that point, I was realizing that oh, I, I, I could I could probably write something. Who knows? Let's try it. And and um, that I this um, the Seder of New Orleans actually is the first thing I ever wrote. Um, oh really? It started out yeah. Um, it started out as a call, uh, a call, and a call for contributions to various anthologies by our own Reverend Eric Bernard, and um, that was, I think it was, the choices were zombies. I want to say, uh, if I remember, there being three choices, but there were zombies, vampire, erotica, and something um and well clearly i we all know what one i chose at that point <laughs> um, i um I, I was like i have been um really enough i i'm not a guy who watches a lot of porn i am very um i i find that the vision of what i want uh, the the woman in question to be is Often too specific for me to um, for me to find an appropriate video right in in in, in like a search under ten minutes, let's say. That's, <laughs> that's, 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 like that's far too that's far too long for someone to be searching for right, something yeah. like this. And <laughs> so I, so I I actually um, uh, uh, got I was drawn to sites like Lydia Erotica for a very long time, and I 
still frequent that website. Um, that it was, uh, there are not a lot of really well written stories, mm-hmm. I had to say, but um, it, sometimes even that doesn't completely matter if it, just, it has just like the right little itching, scratching mechanism to it. But, um, but I was realizing as I was reading, it's like, okay, so just throw some vampires in there and they like, I can, I can, I can, I know I can write better than this fucking thing I'm reading right now. And, and so with all the, with all the, the memories of having kind of recently at that time, um, gone to New Orleans, I'm like, sure, let's make a little short story travel log thing and submit it and then see what happens. That, um, I did that, I got about, I made that about 10 pages, I think, and then I sent it off and then it was, and then I sent it to the wrong email address and then like it, that, that went nowhere. But then time passed. <laughs> and then I went to school, I went to college, I went to university, and throughout all of that, I learned, I, I, I had a much deeper appreciation of language than I ever imagined I, I would have. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> that um, I, 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 I was, I was, something was sparked in me when I, when I was reading um, a couple of ideas by Martin Heidegger, who <laughs> Basically, he, he basically encouraged those who were uh, thinking passionately about his thoughts to um, be playful with words, um, be, uh, introduce words uh, in ways that are not of the norm, and thus uh, like it will um, it will open up new avenues in people like the new synaptic paths. As people are reading, and, and I'm like, that. I don't know how, but I want to do that with what I do with right. writing, writing with music, with what the fuck ever. And so I go back <laughs> to this story mm-hmm. after having after having um, written um, a couple of short stories that were that got um, put in the 2017 edition of the Ladies and Gentlemen of Horror anthology and um those were the i'll be enough those were the, the my first taste of publishing really but um then i went back to this and as i'm reading it i'm reading it back and i'm like holy shit i have so much i could say like I, like all of these i have all of these thoughts that i can see are these are not fleshed out at all. I have become such a better writer after all of my like all of my philosophy paper writing experience, and why not bring this to the the real destiny it deserves? Mm-hmm. And I just I started revising, and it it took probably I don't know um, a year, probably more, wow. but um, I I really tinkered with it and. and I, I tried as hard as I could to get just the right words at just the right places, and it was a very meticulous process, but eventually, after some rewrites, some editing, more rewrites, eventually it, I basically morphed a 10-pager into a 74-pager. Jeez. All right. Well, I prepped you to, to read a, a bit of this, for the audience. Uh, do you want to do that now? Sure. So this is a bit of an excerpt from uh, Gregory T. Cross's The Seder of New Orleans. Uh, mm-hmm. So yeah, whenever you're ready. After a good few, after a few good cynical laughs, Alice and Rita said goodnight and parted ways, each retiring to her own personal sanctuary. The night was a little chill, 
and Rita was mindful of her surroundings as she made her way back to the hotel, walking briskly past romantic architecture with an admiring eye. Now that she was alone, she was also distracted by her vivid memory of the count. She really was not the overanalyzing type, but she had to admit she was trying too hard not to analyze the minutia of her brief encounter with him. The feelings he had stirred in her sparked a familiar need, and so she allowed her favorite part of the memory, the warmth of his eyes, to envelop her as she undressed and stepped into the shower. So it gets detailed from there. I want to talk a little bit about... Um, I mean, we're, we're, we're close to an hour already, so uh, I, I want to make sure I can hit a number of questions here. But um, uh, let's start with a brief synopsis, because y you've teased a little bit of this woman who has had this visceral, at least to herself, experience the vision of an individual that has stirred her so much as she's stepping into the shower. Can you give the audience a brief rundown of what the story is about? Sure. We've got a um, a woman and her best friend running a business in Southern California and decide that they, um, or at least <laughs> she, wants a bit of time off, deserved time off, and uh, heads to New Orleans and um, finds a mysterious gentleman who excites her in ways that um, she had not as uh, as yet experienced and um <laughs> she he and the woman who uh, uh kind of introduces them have fun in ways that are not suitable for this audience at the point <laughs> and um and uh um she finds out uh, eventually that he is a little more than uh, she had bargained for even though it is a welcome addition right so i i think it's interesting i mean clearly uh to anyone who reads you know the first few pages you're going to get a sense that you're you're leaning heavily into some you know familiar territory at least in concept with the count um, and I don't want to give away everything in the story, but I do want to lean into um, what what inspires you to write a story that leans heavily into the idea of a vampire. And then ultimately, how does your story differentiate itself from all the other stories that have come before it? I, um, I would imagine... If I could answer that with any honesty at all, it's probably the way I write. Mm -hmm. It's the, um, I have never, <laughs> I, 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 I've seen, I mean, I hit so many familiar tropes, that, like I'm not going to lie, the, um, that my, I set out to just write the best story of this type that I could. Um, and I knew, um, I knew what I needed to include, and I knew what I didn't really want to include, but but I, it's really in the devil's in the details. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the, um, like the, the children of the night, what music they make, the, like, music has always been a uh, part of the dare I say vampire mythos, but uh, perhaps not explored as um, as specifically as uh, as I do it. Um, and besides which, there's uh, not uh, <laughs> there was a review left of the, of uh, this little book of mine on. Um, on Amazon, 
who um, that, that that hinted at maybe the count is um, is a little bit more than vampire, mm-hmm. and and frankly, he's right. Uh, um, there is the, the <laughs> I it was written initially as a vampire story, and it became. It became something more by the end, but there's not a lot of um, there isn't a lot in the story to to actually hint that there's a, that that is something more. So kudos to that reviewer for catching it. But um, I wanted I wanted I, I wanted to do to tackle a project like this with. Well, words that I have never really found in these types of stories before. Where, uh, um, I've never even, it's, it's usually for one thing told from, like, Dracula is um, not told from the vampire's perspective at all, but, um, right. but uh, and neither is this one, but it's, uh, I wanted it not to be from the vampire's perspective, but um, I wanted the I wanted his I wanted his perspective to inform the perspective uh, um, from whom I was writing. Right. Well, you certainly get that feel that they are clearly uh, enraptured, not only in the. <laughs> societal typical understanding of what that means the vampire but also the the romantic side of it the allure the the mystery um the the titillation that comes with um that sort of a monstrous and beautiful visage you know of a vampire um and i think you did that really well i i am interested in knowing and let me preface this by saying there's this beautiful little film called As Good As It Gets. Um, and there's this really wonderful line in it uh, because the main character, played by Jack Nicholson, is a writer. And he writes these romance novels. Uh, he goes to his publishers one day and the publisher's secretary essentially costs uh, Jack's uh, character and says, I need to know you've touched me so deeply in everything you've written. How, what is it that makes you write women so well? And uh, Jack Nicholson looks down at this young woman and says, I think of a man and I take away all understanding and accountability. And then he closes the, <laughs> the, the door. So how <laughs> that leads me. And I think that was a, just a really funny moment in a film. This really belittling to any female character. Um, especially coming from someone who adored him for writing so deeply to women, uh, reason and accountability uh, being stripped away. How do you write women? What is it that you are able to tap into that you feel like you can appropriately write women? And especially in such intimate of ways as this. I love them. That's it. That's the, um, Really cheap and cliche answer that I won't go go into uh, go into too far, but um, mm-hmm. <laughs> the um, our uh, oddly enough our founder um, he has that uh, he has that piece um, if I remember the name correctly Confessions of a Closet Misogynist um, <laughs> the uh, I can't say that uh, that. My sentiments completely echo <laughs> what he says in there, but um, I I was <laughs> I was raised in a very feminist household, um, um, a very a very feminist household and a very um, a very. accepting of sexuality household mm-hmm. um i wanted, <laughs> wanted to say um very 
um, sex positive, but it, but it's it's like it, it, we, we were too uh, we were a bit too closed off from each other to have that kind of talk. Um, it was um, I. <laughs> I started having um, massive phone vibrations <laughs> right in my ear. Oh my <laughs> gosh. Is that like resting delicately on top of the microphone? That's the loudest vibration. My goodness. It's um, oddly enough, the uh, my phone is rest. Uh, um, the, the thing that usually keeps it up is resting on a DVD kit of um, the H the collected HBO series Spawn, <laughs> and, and it's a tin kit. It's a tin um, case, so yeah. that 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 is um, interacting with yeah. my phone in Absolutely. fun ways. Um, <laughs> nice. <laughs> I um I started having um let's call them explicit thoughts about. The fairer sex um, at around age seven, and and um, that informed so much of so much of my fantasy life. Basically, um, I started. I, I, I studied my own fantasies. I studied. I studied um, the way the way I would see women walk and the way they um uh, there's a lot of body language basically mm. um and and a, a, a bit of porn because it, because you kind of have to but at the same time it like you you like even even i in my studies but i, I was aware that like, this isn't like the this isn't the real deal mm. so to speak um and <clears throat> more than that, though, I was, I studied the way other authors would write women. And I, I, uh, I have been renowned by all, all except one, all girlfriends I've had except one. Um, I have been renowned by them before my general understanding of women. Humble, bro. I, and the and of course the, uh, the the one who the the one who didn't uh, it was partially because we never really got the chance to because we were only dating for about three months. So, so um, yeah, well, what can you do? Yeah. But um, I. I grew enamored with, enamored of their, their myth, their secrets, the, basically the, the, the whole package and it was, I, I was, to use a word that you used uh, just a little while ago, enraptured by the feminine spirit. Mm -hmm. All this, and I, and I just, uh, I just knew that I, had to uh, for a lot of and I, I noticed that a lot of erotic work, um, especially on the erotica, focuses around uh, focuses around the women's uh, the, the woman's point of view. So I'm realizing just now that, that actually might have pushed me over to that side because is I am <laughs> I am. Um, not as I, 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 I don't have much experience writing from the, the more masculine point of view because I was um, as I've been I, 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 I was a, I've been a Californian all my life but I've also been for most of my life a liberal Californian mm -hmm. <laughs> and I have since taken a turn so that I am a, a fairly right-wing Californian, which makes me a complete fucking anomaly, of course. <laughs> and, 
but uh, but I have not been in that state of mind for long enough that I can that like I could I, I couldn't write um, or, like what Jack London, for instance, writes. Um, I don't have the uh, there's a line there's a line in Californication um, when um, when Hank Moody is finally being uh, found out about the about the uh, the manuscript that was stolen off of him. His yeah. agent his, his agent mentions like this is great, but dude, you write what you know. Is this? <laughs> <laughs> and, and he's just like, <laughs> and and the th and the thing is, I I understand I'm I'm not um, I have imagination. I like to I like to I would like to say, but I'm not, um, especially with uh, during the time I was writing this, um, I I was not confident enough in that kind of that part of my imagination to. Um, to explore what it was I didn't know. Right. So so I, I was like, okay, so I know I can kind of flesh out this this count character a bit. So I and the and make him the the like arch, archetypical male kind of figure with all like the, being all debonair and aristocratic and whatnot. But I can I think I am most um, I, I can more accurately flesh out the details of this particular woman's thought. Yeah. And so I had to go with that. Nice. Well, I think you did a really wonderful job. Um, you know, a little over halfway through and I'm enjoying it. So like genuinely, uh, I did find myself, uh, in this, awkward position of uh sitting and reading it on my screen because i got the kindle edition uh as my family was doing their daily interactions behind me and i'm just like i ugh, if they only stopped and read what i'm reading like, i feel so dirty right now for be for reading this while they're all living their day like it's just like this weird i don't know multi-dimensional experience that was just filthy so <laughs> I'm, doing, I'm doing my job. For I mean, there's no two thing. ways about it. This is a straight up erotic fiction. Like uh, it's it's pretty deep mm -hmm. and heavy in the erotic side of things. Um, I don't know. Would you would you reflect on this as like a romance novel? No, never. There was um, <laughs> that was. It is probably uh, some people would probably want me to market it that way just because the just because the market is more um it, it is more palatable to that kind of a market but it's yeah the, the 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 closest i would get to that is it's like paranormal erotica right. or something like that it, it's it can't be you say you're you're about halfway through it so mm -hmm. I, I i would say that um by the end if I'm doing my job well, then you will probably get a taste of like, okay, so like she, maybe she has, um, like, uh, she's get, getting obviously a very positive impression mm -hmm. of this count, but, uh, she's, it, it's not, um, uh, it's not like a relationship kind of thing. It's, um, it's like, okay, we're, uh, uh <laughs> Like I can, I can tell we're getting along very well and all that, but let, let's be real. We're fucking, yeah. We're, we're not making love. Right. I mean, there is very much, you lead in with this tone of her solidly understanding that, yeah, this, this is me needing this. And I can't, you know, as the character, she's, she's saying to herself, I can't tell if this is real or not. And I'm not entirely sure I care if it's real or not because it's something that I need. Like I, I need to indulge in this because it's a desire mm -hmm. that's within me. And, and that I find um, pretty interesting because, you know, ultimately we live our lives having momentary 
lapses of fantasy with individuals that we may brush across through life or maybe we work with or we live with or whatever it is. And sometimes those fantasies end up being nightmarish and sometimes they pan out and being really, truly wonderful. Uh, but ultimately, they're things that they're experiences we need. And, and mm. hopefully, in most cases, we keep them to ourselves so we don't creep other people out. <laughs> But in truth, we need them. You know, we dream about it. We we fantasize about it. It's just it, in as in as much as we were leading into this conversation early on about ritual being so important to our lives. I think fantasy is as important um, to us. And and maybe maybe the fantasy is more important than the actual realization in some cases as well. But certainly sometimes it's healthier. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and with less, less repercussions long term. Um, in either case, I think ultimately. Uh, that's what she was experiencing up until the point that I am. Um, I, I, again, we're, we're, we're a bit over time here, so I don't want to go. Uh, well, I do want to go further, but I, I, I'm afraid we really can't. Uh, let's give the good people uh, again uh, a, another chance to uh, know where to find this so you can get it from Amazon, Barnes & Nobles. But you had mentioned that there's a discount on Lulu. Yeah, the print edition is 25% off. Okay, and so the, the digital is still the same, but the print's 25 off. Is that right? Mm -hmm. okay. That's it. Um, ultimately, I think if I knew that, I would have bought the print edition, to be <laughs> honest. But uh, I ended up just going to Amazon and getting the Kindle version. Um, I mean, you, you can't argue with 25% off. And, you know, that's shipping, essentially. Yeah. You know, shipping plus, maybe. So that's great. Uh, you can't argue with that. Uh, check it out for yourselves, everyone. Uh, is there anywhere that you would be comfortable sharing where people can find you online or maybe to connect with you? Sure. Um, I, I'm probably not going to end up adding all these uh, all these lovely people as friends right. necessarily on Facebook, but I do have the uh, I do have the follow option open there. So Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and I'm all, it's either Grigori T. Cross or Grigori Cross as one, like, no space, no capital mm -hmm. thing. It's all, it's, I, I'm, I'm, I'm at all the major social media outlets. Yeah. Well, you can also find all of those links directly in the show announcement on the website, uh, reverendcampbell.com as well. And of course, if you got this in the email, it's probably going to be in that too. Um, Gregory, thank you so much for joining me, man. It's been a lot of fun talking to you. Oh, it's been a blast. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. And for all of you uh, joining us live, I'm sorry I didn't call out each and every one of you. I appreciate you guys tuning in. I know it's a bit of a hassle coming out of this new place. And then, of course, learning how to create an account and log in so you can chat online. And it's, you know, there's a lot of hurdles that I'm not even necessarily expecting you to go through, but I appreciate that you have in most cases. So thank you guys so much for your attention and uh, for your willingness to go down all of these different roads with us. Um, <laughs> check out this book. Seriously, it's interesting. It'll take you to some places. <laughs> <laughs> it, it will. It really will. I suggest reading it alone, though. Not with family behind you, because it creates a weird, awkward moment, like this weird dichotomy in your head, like, oh, I want to enjoy this, but I don't want to enjoy it because I know who's behind me and there's family and stuff. So, um, or read it with your spouse. <laughs> what's that? Read it with your spouse. Or read it with your spouse. That's true. That would be nice. Um, okay, so... If you want to support the show, if you want to find out who's going to be on next, what we're going to be talking to, subscribe to the email list, uh, like, uh, subscribe to the YouTube channel, and, uh, you know, you'll be notified. That's kind of it. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. Thank you, Grigori, so much again for uh, joining me on the show and talking about your project. I really do appreciate it. And until we can speak of the den devil again, my friend, hail Satan. Hail Satan. <laughs>